Getting back to data models, I'd like to cover an aspect of creating or populating the attribute values. And that's in assigning them, we have to assign a value that corresponds to the entire area covered by a raster cell or by a polygon. And many areas, almost all areas, aren't pure. Most everything is at least a little bit mixed, and that creates some issues in some analyses. We just have to keep those in mind. For example, if I'm digitizing here a polygon for a flower bed, I might say that the cover type in the attribute for that flower bed is mulch. But clearly there is something amiss here where these two paths run through. These are concrete paths. And so I have this inclusion that's non-mulch, even though the attribute may say mulch. And there are lots of times when this occurs. For example, if you look at soils data from the National Natural Resource Conservation Service. For Iowa, it says that areas of soils that were markedly different in use and management but too small to be delineated for these polygons or cells in the distribution um, were included inside the map units. So they appear to be errors at a larger scale if you really zoom in. And if you walk over the ground, you'll find something of a different kind. Here's an example where we have the percent soil carbon we're mapping, and you can see the variation across the landscape. Darker areas have higher soil carbon. It's associated with fertility. And if I look at a cell and sample from within the cell for my raster data set here, I might get values that vary across a range. And I have some average value or highest value or some value that I assign within that range. And I do that across all of my cells. There's variation within the cell and an average value reported or some value reported for the cell that's representative. So there's always this sampling problem. And that's true with categorical data or ordinal data also in that I may have a land cover class here that has nominal data of what's the land cover type, land or water. And some are easy. They're overwhelmingly land or overwhelmingly water. But some fall somewhere in between. You have to call this something. Is C going to be land or water? Um, so you have to basically decide what are the rules for assignment. And in your analysis, think if these inclusions will render invalid your conclusions. Raster and vector models often have the same form in the sense you have geographic data and a table, but the tables are often constructed differently. Often with vector models, usually with vector models, you have this one-to-one -one relationship between features. So there's one polygon for each of the rows in an associated table. So, oops, goes to here to this one. And so there's just as many across all the way. So I have to be careful in not assuming that's true for raster data, mostly because there's so many raster cells, I can't have a table entry. What we typically do is have some class identifier, and there'll be as many entries as there are unique identifiers for the raster. And for continuous data, for interval ratio data, there will be no uh, table or a table that will summarize statistics and not a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between table values and what's found in the raster. Another thing I'd like to talk about is single part versus multi part. Now, we usually say we have a one to one relationship between geographic features, that is, each individual polygon has a row, but sometimes we want to use multi part shapes. Now, we can't have one row for each polygon here. If, if we have a, a United States or any provincial map, we have one row for each state, but that means if we have one row for each state, we'll have multiple geographic features pointing at one row. So there's many islands that make up Hawaii, and those all point at one row. And that's okay. We just have to realize that that's a multi-part shape, and when we do certain calculations, they might apply differently. Um, so we have usually a one-to-one -one relationship, but in multi-part shapes, we have we don't have a one-to-one -one relationship. We have a many-to-one relationship between the geography features and the, the table. And it's fine as long as we recognize that we can convert multi-part to single part. We may want to pull out pieces for an analysis or look at things individually. 
Note that when you do multi-part to single-part conversion, we create a one-to-one -one relationship between rows and polygons. So we went from one row to actually 104 rows here because of all the small islands. But also note that the attributes aren't correctly created for each of these. It just copies the same attribute. So I have the same population with each of these polygons. And clearly, most of the population is on one of the islands, but it says each of these remaining assigned features gets the values associated with the, the group. So you have to be careful in the kind of analysis that you're doing in how you interpret the attributes depending upon how they get converted in this one-to-one -one relationship. So there's always some sampling involved. You always have to be careful about the sampling. If you want to later on work with individual pieces of data, you really should start with the most granular data to begin with, the data that are collected at a fine scale, and save that. You can aggregate it up for other things, but save the um, granular data. So just uh, a quick coverage here of the sort of trade-offs in sampling and some nuances about how the data are stored in raster versus vector and being careful about these one-to-one -one relationships.